there are altogether four 70-year periods of judgment of the house of Israel, so it is easy to confuse them. The cause of the first judgment was the idolatry of the whole nation of Israel over a period of 390 years, from the temple's dedication in 1018 BC to 628 BC when Jeremiah began his ministry. At the end of these 390 years, well after the northern nation of Israel had been taken captive by Assyria, Jeremiah began his ministry and for the 40 years from 628 BC to 588 BC, he warned Judah against idolatry. Also, God told Jeremiah that the 390 years of sin up to 628 BC would result in 70 years of servitude to Babylon. This 70 years of servitude began in 609 BC when the Assyrian Empire fell to Babylon and lasted to 539 BC when Babylon was conquered by the Medo-Persians. The territory of the Northern Kingdom, now under Assyrian occupation, came under Babylonian rule. Its population had been deported to Mesopotamia by the Assyrians, so it too came under Babylonian rule. Jeremiah had warned the kings of Judah to submit to Babylon. When Judah did not submit, it faced the more severe punishment of captivity and then desolation. So in 607 BC, Nebuchadnezzar came and attacked Jehoiakim, conquered Judah and took some of its princes captive. One of these was Daniel. This began the second of our four 70 year periods of judgment, the captivity in Babylon from 607 BC until 537 BC, when Cyrus issued his famous decree and the captives began to return under Zerubbabel. This captivity resulted from the sin of Judah. Because Jehoiakim and the last two kings of Judah who followed him, Jehoiachin and Zedekiah, still continued to rebel against Babylon, the level of captivity increased until Nebuchadnezzar began the final siege of Jerusalem in 588 BC that would result in the third 70-year period of judgment, total captivity and desolation of the land and Jerusalem from 588 BC until 518 BC, when the Lord told Zechariah that the desolation of the land and Jerusalem had ended. Finally, at the end of two more years, the walls of Jerusalem were breached and the temple was destroyed, beginning the fourth 70-year period of judgment, the 70 years of the desolation of the temple from 586 BC until 516 BC, when the rebuilt temple was dedicated. Jeremiah 25.1 is a crucial verse, giving us a perfect connecting link between sacred and secular chronology. It tells us that the fourth year of Jehoiakim is the accession year of Nebuchadnezzar. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. This is the first time we are given a dated synchronism with a Gentile king. At some point, you see, it's necessary for the sacred chronology of Israel to be tied to the secular chronology of the nations so that we can deduce absolute dates. God did this at this point 
of history for two reasons. Firstly, he had to choose a time when the secular records are accurate and trustworthy, otherwise he would not achieve his purpose. Linking Israel's history to the start of Nebuchadnezzar's reign implies this date can be established without question from the secular history, and indeed this is the case. In fact, it is only from this very time that we have absolute certainty and accuracy concerning the dates of secular history. Secondly, it's appropriate that at the start of the era of Gentile dominion over Israel, called the Times of the Gentiles, that would last over 2,500 years, that God established a connecting link between Israel's chronology and the start of the reign of the first of these great Gentile powers who would have dominion over Israel, who was Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold in the vision. And so you see that that Gentile dominion was reflected in the fact that now Israel's chronology is tied to the Gentile chronology. Now, we know from the Babylonian records that Nab Nabopolassar died in the 8th of Av, 605 BC. That's the 8th of August on our own calendar. And he died shortly after Nebuchadnezzar's famous victory over Egypt at Carchemish in that year, which secured Babylonian dominance. Nebuchadnezzar rushed back to Babylon to take the throne on the 1st of Elul, which is the 31st of August. Therefore, Nebuchadnezzar's accession year started from this point, until the following Nisan in 604 BC, which was the start of his first regnal year, for the Babylonians used Nisan years. Thus, the vision of the image in Daniel 2 in his second year was from Nisan 603 to 602 BC. Jeremiah 25.1 and Jeremiah 46.2 locate both Carchemish and Nebuchadnezzar's enthronement in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. Therefore, the fourth year of Jehoiakim must have been from Tishri, that is October, 606 BC, to Tishri, 605 BC, as the kings of Judah always used Tishri years. And so the third year of Jehoiakim, when Daniel went into captivity, which marked the start of the Babylonian captivity, must be from Tishri, 607 BC, to Tishri, 606 BC. A wonderful confirmation of this is that we can now see, unlike most other chronologies, we can now see how there were exactly 70 years of captivity to Babylon, according to Jeremiah 29, verse 10, which says, Thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. All agree that the end point of these 70 years must be the Cyrus decree in the first year of Cyrus the Great as king of Babylon. This is recorded in 2 Chronicles 36. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you all, of his people, may the Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. Cyrus had already been king of Persia for some time, but he then conquered Babylon in October 539 BC, and this brought the 70 years of Babylonian domination over the nations to, to an end in perfect fulfilment of Jeremiah 25, 9 and 12. 
Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord. And I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against all these nations round about. And I will utterly destroy them and make them a horror and a hissing and an everlasting desolation. Then it will be, when seventy years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, declares the Lord, for their iniquity, and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it an everlasting desolation. The starting date for these seventy years was given in Jeremiah 27.1 as the start of Jehoiakim's reign, which was Tishri 609 BC. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus we see that these 70 years were exact. Initially, when Babylon was conquered, Cyrus installed his uncle Darius the Mede as king of Babylon. Daniel 5, 30 and 31 says, That very night, the very night of Babylon's fall, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, the kingdom of Babylon, being about 62 years old. Now Daniel 9.1 says he was made king, that is, Cyrus installed him as king of Babylon, which then had the dominion over Israel. He was made king by a higher power. Now it appears that Darius only reigned one year, as only his first year is mentioned. Daniel 9.1 says in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den during this year, as we read in Daniel 6. Then the king gave orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. After the brief reign of Darius, the Mede, Cyrus took on the kingship of Babylon. Daniel 6.28 says, So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Thus Darius's first regnal year was, was from Nisan 538 BC to 537 BC. And Cyrus's first year as king of Babylon was Nisan 537 BC to 536 BC. If Daniel was taken captive at the start of the third year of Jehoiakim, that is in Tishri 607 BC, the 70 years of captivity in Babylon ended at Tishri 537 BC with the Cyrus decree which was right in the middle of his first year, so that works perfectly. This is also consistent with a pre-fulfillment in days of Daniel's 70 weeks. Daniel 9, 1 and 2 says, In the first year of Darius, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. The dramatic downfall of Babylon stimulated Daniel to study Jeremiah's prophecies about the 70 years of servitude and captivity and desolations, which were now approaching their fulfillment. This caused him to pray for Israel's promised restoration, which he did. So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplications, with fasting, sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned, 
committed iniquity, acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. In response, the angel Gabriel came to him in Daniel 9.20-23. to Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplications before the Lord my God on behalf of the holy mountain of my God, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to meet to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O oh Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed, so give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. And he gave him the prophecy of the 77s, the 70 weeks, at the end of which God will have restored Israel through his anointed deliverer, Messiah. That's Daniel 9.24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Ultimately, of course, this was fulfilled by Christ at the end of 490 years. However, 490 days from early on in Darius's first year takes us to halfway through Cyrus's first year, Tishri, 537 BC, which is when he made his famous Cyrus Decree, which ended the Jewish captivity in Babylon and released them to return to their land. In this, Cyrus was acting as God's anointed deliverer. As it says in 2 Chronicles 36, 22 and 23, Ezra 1, 1 and Isaiah 44, 28 and Isaiah 45, verse 1. God raised Cyrus up for this purpose. This decree brought the 70 years of servitude captivity to their close, right on time. And so the 490 weeks, as it were, gave a prophecy that gave the, a time that Daniel would, would know when the Cyrus degree would actually happen, and this would be a, a major uh, s step in Israel's restoration, uh, bringing them out of captivity the captivity that uh, Jeremiah had talked about. Thus, as an immediate answer to Daniel's prayer, the prophecy hinted that the first stage of Israel's restoration would be in 490 days, and this was fulfilled through Cyrus. But this was just a type of her ultimate restoration, which would come through Christ the greater than Cyrus, after a period of 490 years. We return now to the remainder of Jehoiakim's reign. We have seen that the Babylonian captivity began in his third year, starting in Tishri, 607 BC. He submitted to this yoke for only three years, after which he rebelled in his sixth year, no doubt encouraged in this by Egypt, according to 2 Kings 24.1. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. In so doing, he was rebelling against God's word through Jeremiah, who had warned Israel that if they did not submit to this discipline of God, their punishment would get worse, which it did. First of all, raiding bands from various countries were sent against Judah as a judgment of God. That's in 2 Kings 24, 2-4. The Lord sent against him bands of Chaldeans, bands of Aramaeans, bands of Moabites, and bands of Ammonites. So he sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken through his servants, the prophets. Surely at the command of the Lord it came upon Judah to remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done and also for the innocent blood which he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord would not forgive. 
Nebuchadnezzar was no doubt busy with other challenges, and so he encouraged these raiding bands until he could deal with Jehoiakim personally. In 601 BC, Babylon came against Egypt, and both sides suffered heavy losses. As a result, Babylon had to take the next year to rebuild its forces, and her following year was also quiet. Meanwhile, Egypt lost its will to come out to challenge Babylon's dominance over the region. We see that in 2 Kings 24-7. The king of Egypt did not come out of his land again, for the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt from the brook of Egypt to the river Euphrates. This meant in the next year, which was from Nizan 598 to 597 BC, which was Nebuchadnezzar's seventh year, Nebuchadnezzar at this point was finally able to come to Judah and deal with Jehoiakim's rebellion. There is a confusion of differing accounts about Jehoiakim's end, but if we stay with the scripture, we will be safe. 2 Chronicles 36, 5 and 6 says, Jehoiakim was 25 when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against him and bound him in bronze fetters to carry him off to Babylon. 2 Kings 24, 6 adds, So Jehoiakim rested with his fathers, then Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his place. He, his eleventh year would have been Tishri 599 to 598 BC. Therefore Nebuchadnezzar came against him and brought his eleven year reign in Jerusalem to an end between Nizan, that is April, and Tishri, that is October, of 598 BC. It seems that he surrendered and was put in chains in order to take him to Babylon, which was a journey of a few months. But the language implies that he never made it to Babylon, but rather he must have died en route. There must have been a short interregnum in Jerusalem, because Jehoiakim only began to reign after Jehoiakim's death, as we see in 2 Kings 24.6. So Jehoiakim rested with his fathers, then Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his place. Obviously, Nebuchadnezzar did not immediately install a king in the place of the captured Jehoiakim, and Israel only appointed her next king once they heard the previous king had died. Although Jehoiakim had invited judgment in his sixth year by rebelling against Babylon, he had already sealed his fate in his fifth year, according to Jeremiah 36. We read in Jeremiah 36, 1 to 8, that in his fourth year, Jeremiah wrote his prophecies on a scroll in order to be read to all the people. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take a scroll and write on it all the words which I have spoken to you concerning Israel and concerning Judah and concerning all the nations from the day I first spoke to you, from the days of Josiah, even to this day. This reading was done in his fifth year. But when it came to the attention of the king, he rejected God's warnings in the strongest possible way by burning the scroll. Now, in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, all the people in Jerusalem and all the people who came from the cities of Judah to Jerusalem proclaimed a fast before the Lord. And Yehudi read it to the king as well as to all the officials who stood beside the king. Now the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month with a fire burning in the brazier before him. When Yehudi had read three or four columns, the king cut it with a scribe's knife and threw it in the fire that was in the brazier, until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the brazier. As a result, Jeremiah announced his death, saying, and this is in Jeremiah 36.30, Thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, his dead body shall be cast out to the heat of the day and to the frost of the night. 
Jeremiah 22.19 paints a similar picture. He shall be buried with the burial of a donkey, dragged and cast out beyond the gates of Jerusalem. Thus, putting all these scriptures together, it seems clear that he was chained and led out of Jerusalem as a captive, only to die on the journey to Babylon, and his body was left exposed to the elements, without even receiving a proper burial. Hello. I'm Derek Walker. I'm the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church. Today I want to introduce you to uh, what I believe is a very special book called The Keys of Time, a revelation of Bible chronology, revealing the keys by which you can unlock the treasure chest of God's Word concerning its revelation of time. And so we start, you see, by looking at the major keys that will unlock this treasure chest like the fact that all time is based on the creation week and one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and we look into the Jubilee and how that also unlocks how God measures time and we look at the principle of unreckoned time and as we see the whole revelation of God in history and time fit together perfectly we will get out of this we'll get a revelation of the glory of God as the sovereign Lord of time, the God who is working out his purposes of grace in his perfect time, according to his redemption timetable. So through this book, God will impart to you a rich understanding of the times, giving you a fresh revelation of the special time in which we are now living near the end of the age.